first question uh, obviously you know we could start with the great gamble as our uh, cover yeah, story yeah, calls sure, it about the sure. demonetization so little that i have heard you speak on the subject you seem to be uh, in agreement conceptually on the idea That's but right. you seem to have some uh, apprehensions on the uh, implementation and yeah. the execution part yeah, yeah. Uh, sir as somebody you know who has tremendous uh, experience yeah. in public yeah. affairs what do you think uh, has been the implementation failure points is it the state capacity or is it like you know the uh, 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 from the finance ministry side they didn't have a kind of a war room like approach yeah, lack of yeah, dashboard so yeah. what do you think was the uh, how do you think the implementation has panned out well there are two major shortfalls of the denomination uh, the de uh, demonetization which the prime minister announced uh, <clears throat> one was that uh, i had myself uh, here in, uh, I think in 2014, had appointed a uh, committee called the Strategic Action Committee of the party, of which I was the chairman. And we had drawn up a set of proposals, and one proposal was definitely, definitely this. Uh, demonetization. Uh, the timing was left to the uh, Prime Minister to be, which uh, Narendra Modi did become. Uh, but I had said two things. One, that there should be a palliative with it. So if you're going to demonetize, uh, at that stage I really thought of only a thousand rupee note. Okay. Um, and perhaps uh, later on 500, 500 after you had digested the effects of the thousand rupee thing. But it should be accompanied by a complete and total abolition of income tax. Absolutely, absolutely. Because I thought that first of all, the black money in the stock form is in abroad. And in India, black money is a flow. Uh, and the flow is, supposing I evade income tax and I get, uh, keep black money, and then I take a taxi ride and I give the taxi driver it his fare, clear. it becomes white. white. Uh, Absolutely. So uh, the the black money is there's no fixed amount in that sense. It it expands and contracts, contracts. depending mm -hmm. on the transactions that are taking place. Uh, so uh, the incentive to evade taxes is the fundamental reason for the uh, augmentation of black money flow in our country. Absolutely. And therefore, I thought uh, that the income tax should be abolished. Number one. Number two. I thought that there should have been a well thought of plan of uh, how to make up for the uh, cash loss cash or loss. cash crunch. And there should have been over the uh, last two and a half years a huge surplus of uh, 100 rupee notes, maybe 200 rupee notes, um, and had it ready. Now, these are parts of the uh, what I call as the contingency, contingency plan. plans. Uh, you don't know when it's going to come. I think finance ministry was under the, an illusion or were up in the clouds <laughs> uh, thinking that this will never happen. Absolutely. And uh, I think uh, uh, probably Mr. Jetley also thought that the prime minister will never act alone. <laughs> uh, so uh, the finance ministry was taking it very casually. Casual. And uh, I also think that some of the things they did was without thinking. For example, uh, this 2,000 rupee note, why was it necessary to change its size? Had you not changed the size, it, the, the ATM factor would have been there. Okay. So, uh, and then we should have decentralized the, uh, the uh, cash um, uh, receipts and uh, de uh, delivery. For example, we have public sector organizations, large public sector organizations, and they have the bulk of the workers. Uh, and uh, we should have told them uh, the uh, day before or the day, the night before that you have to distribute it. Yeah. And we have already made arrangements for trucks to reach you. Reach you. And uh, you distribute the cash, cash. or accept Next. the cash. Yeah. Uh, so instead of uh, everybody rushing to the bank, bank, and then the bank either being overworked or then finding loopholes by which they can do it. The third thing I had said uh, after the uh, announcement 
is now you say anybody who has 500 rupee note, 1000 rupee notes, whether they uh, are counted, unaccounted, let him put it in his own account, no questions asked. asked. And then 25% uh, government will take it away. 25% you can withdraw as cash so that cash augmentation takes, takes place, place. Uh, of the new notes. Nope. And 50% in fixed deposit for uh, five years at 2% interest. interest. Which is, I think the government has kind of... Uh, I, I know, variation. Now, now you see, yeah, the variation is the deadly part. <laughs> it's a self-destructing part. Mr. The finance ministry changed it. Uh, it was actually, I didn't directly give it. Somebody on behalf of the prime minister was uh, a very eminent person. person. He told me that he's looking for suggestions, give it to me. <laughs> so I gave it to him, he passed it on, I think. And why I say that the, uh, the finance ministry amendment was deadly, I mean it's self-destructive, is he changed, the, the finance ministry changed the tax to 50%. Now at 30% uh, you are getting uh, you are getting the informal market converting. Convert, okay. So why should he pay 50% when he can get it at 30%? 30%, absolutely. Uh, that you could not stop, that was going on. There was, it was, uh, Indians are too smart, <laughs> you know, they can't be caught no. on everything. Absolutely. And then, you see, uh, it, somebody said uh, to me that, well, it's legitimate if you give to the government. I said, who can tell? Your name is now in black and white. How do you know next year <laughs> I, 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 they won't use it against you? Right, uh, right. Particularly right. if they don't like you. <laughs> so, therefore, people were not prefer the risk of giving it to the uh, dalal and getting uh, paying a less amount. And so that also has been another loophole. Yeah. And so. the most important part, I said, there'll be collateral damages. Okay. Uh, uh, supposing now, to, for instance, I'm a truck uh, freight uh, uh, truck freight uh, owner. I have to send my truck from, say, the Bombay to Madras. I have to give in cash to the driver uh, for about 40,000, uh, 45,000 rupees, because he has to pay, pay the toll tax on the way. On the way. Maybe the bribe, which will not go away just because you have demonetized. <laughs> And uh, then he has to go to the Dhaba and eat his lunch, yeah, dinner yeah. and breakfast. Yeah. Then he has to pay, buy petrol and diesel. Absolutely. So he doesn't have 45, uh, he doesn't have the uh, 45,000 cash Though anymore. I might have to just interject Swamiji yeah. is that great uh, three loopholes that you pointed out. But some of the trucking industry seem to have managed through it, you know, like there's shown some resilience because, yeah. I mean, I was also honestly expecting that there will be a supply chain disruption, but, you know, there have, there have been some loopholes, but truck, the, the supply chain still now has not, you know, collapsed the way that, you know, it was feared initially, so. Uh, well, it didn't collapse, <laughs> but it did, it has slowed, you, know. it's, you see, everything has gone down, the rate, rate of growth has gone down, down. the uh, employment rate has gone down. Everything has gone, the stock market has gone down. Right, right. So, uh, indicate uh, uh -huh. one all early this, warning. All these could have been avoided. Yeah. Swami, uh, and uh, Dr. Swami, the other important point that you brought about is that, you know, everybody knows that you are the, uh, probably the first politician, uh, for the first uh, mainstream academic uh, economist yeah. who kind of advocated the idea of abolishing the uh, income tax. You know, like I've seen you advocated as late yeah, as. Yeah, long time. Long time back. And uh, looks like. That particular idea, at least in the Indian context, is gaining traction. For example, the magazine that uh, yeah, I run, yeah, we, yeah. we wrote two pieces. I saw that. One is like a civilizational case against income tax, and another is a moral case against civilization yeah. income tax. Yes. You know, uh, because in India, if you really look at indirect taxes, have been much more uh, largely successful because income tax somehow, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. people try to evade yeah. it. So. From your early, uh, you know, thought process, what drove you to suggest that, you know, this IT is a very regressive tax or it needs to be abolished? What was your thinking process? Uh, and general public complaint, they're, they're being <laughs> harassed, you see. Uh, I myself, when I came back from America, I was not a known political figure. Uh, we were getting our taxes cut at the source uh, of my salary, you see, of IIT, I was a professor yeah. at IIT. But uh, the, the income tax guy would send a notice saying, please appear before me in the Aikar Bhavan. 
and you'll ask me all kinds of irrelevant questions. Ultimately, say, I am going on a vacation to <laughs> with my family to Kashmir. Please uh, fund it. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll uh, make a claim for you. I think things have you. not changed much, looks like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm now talking about 70, 71. So I, uh, anyway, I thought socialism was bunk. <laughs> and uh, I said so at that time. Absolutely. And, uh, and it turned out to be true. <laughs> so uh, uh, our growth rates have grown up, uh, grown, up, grown by leaps and bounds. We were growing at 3.5% per year. Now we are 9% is nothing for us. So uh, I, I think uh, one of the greatest injustices done by Jawaharlal Nehru was to foist this Soviet model Absolutely. On, on India. Absolutely. Yeah. Prime Minister often uh, emphasizes on the demographic dividend. You know, you have so many uh, millions of youth entering the yeah. workforce every time. But if you look at the uh, structural challenges across the world, I mean, not necessarily of India, you know, like artificial intelligence and you know, the automation, the labor intensity of employment has completely shrunk. You know, like for example, Facebook or even WhatsApp was basically some 30 employees created it and you know the valuation. So you know the entire labor intensity, labor intensity of employment has gone and with India going to, uh, you know, churn out uh, youth by millions actually and where do you see the job yeah. opportunities uh, really yeah. coming up <clears throat> because you know in, in the consequence of uh, dissatisfied youth is, you know, the po I mean, you have lived lived through the turbulent yeah, times yeah, where yeah. they get into political agitations yeah, or you yeah, know yeah. the left wing terror movements. Yeah. So, what is your take? Where where do you see India's economic engine firing? Which is going to be the key? Uh, well, first of all, let me tell you, at, uh, as early as uh, 1969, 70, a famous uh, population expert. Uh, uh, Ghosh, his name was. Uh, he was in the economic uh, Indian Economic Institute. He wrote. He brought a book on population, and he had one chapter of mine, where I said that people talk of population as a liability, but it is also an asset. asset. So it depends on how you uh, uh, prepare your population. Now, when you talk about demographic dividend, what you are talking about is that young population are capable of if properly empowered by education, education. to go do innovation. innovation. Innovations change everything. Absolutely. After all, what was the Industrial Revolution all about? It was the lo locomotive, locomotive, the Bessemer steel uh, uh, blast furnace. What was the American Revolution about? It is about mass production of automobiles, jet engines, jet engine. automobiles, uh, turnpikes. Uh, so these, uh, and then in the recent years is the internet which has changed the way you do business. Yeah. Uh, you can sit in New York and run. No, uh, that is the part countries. of my question that unlike now, your so earlier... Now, 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 yeah. now, now <coughs> you say these have limited potential for employment. That is as the product itself. But the, uh, the uh, industries that feed into uh, making this product, they are all, uh, if you add them all up, it is much more. Okay. That's why we uh, uh, economists use input-output analysis because there is something called direct employment and indirect employment. And I'm telling you all modern innovations have a very high indirect uh, uh, generation of employment. Absolutely. But the population has to be skilled. skilled. Our problem is dividend is not a dividend yet. yet. It's a potential Absolutely. dividend. But you have to somehow educate this population. And the kind of priority we should have given to education, we have not given. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, therefore, and we have to change mindset. mindset. Our Indian mindset is risk aversion. We have to educate them to take risk and then go into fields where they may fail, but they must not give up. Absolutely. They keep trying. Absolutely. These are mindset changes that have to be brought about before the demographic surplus uh, of young population can be become a dividend. Great responsibility. Uh, <laughs> Sir, uh, on black money, as you know, you have fought a long battle against it. Yes. Your party claims that uh, it, they are fighting a uh, battle against them. So what do you think, how they are approaching it, <laughs> are they approaching it the uh, right way or what are the specific steps that you would like them to take? Sure. So first of all, the most important part of black money inside the country is just income tax. Absolutely. Knock it off. Even in indirect tax, of all the commodities, you rank them by the revenue they provide. provide. For, huh? 
first 21 will give you 90% of the income tax, uh, indirect tax. So why are you putting it on the remaining thousands and thousands <laughs> of commodities? It has its own costs. Just remove, yeah, and it has its costs. So uh, as far as India is concerned, within India, you just simply uh, A, abolish income tax, knock off all these uh, this uh, registration tax and all for uh, real estate. Uh, what is the need for uh, paying taxes I, and having a stamp paper, filling out, and of course, if the income, because of income tax, they, they understate the value of the property. Uh, all that needs to be removed. But the bigger problem of, of one trillion dollars abroad is in 70 countries, you have secret banking. Not all countries. The United States does not have secret banking. India does not have secret banking. Uh, but there are 70 countries in the world uh, where there is secret banking. So in 2005, uh, the uh, 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 United Nations had uh, passed a resolution on corruption. And it said that if a country passes a legislation saying that their nationals accounts in these 70 countries are nationalized, the United Nations will help them acquire that bank account and the money in it. And those are, and you have to have a provision that if any of them can prove that the bank was legally open and the money there is legal, then it will be returned back to him. Uh, this was the uh, suggestion. Now, uh, the uh, the, uh, the um, uh, Egyptians did it with Marcos's. They specifically said Marcos uh, accounts are hereby nationalized. Uh, the United Philippines, Nations. you mean? Philippines? No, no. Uh, uh, Philippines Egypt is the earlier one, early Marcos. One. Yeah. But I'm talking about uh, uh, the, this guy, um, uh, um, uh, what is his name? The president of uh, Egypt, uh, Mubarak. Mubarak. Mubarak's yeah. and Gaddafi. They have got it back. There are other methods also. There, there is, of course, a very small method, I mean, a small value method, and that is the, with the Switzerland, for example, we have mutual assistance pact. If you can say Sonia Gandhi has an account in Saracen Bank, which is uh, head office is in Geneva, or that Rahul Gandhi has an account in Pictet Bank in Zurich, and they do. Uh, uh, and I've given it in writing to the finance ministry. Uh, then you can tell the Swiss through a uh, letter rogatory, please help us get it. You will get it. But that's. So what's the problem here, sir? There the problem is the finance minister is not. Uh, they don't want to go that Doesn't distance. want to pursue this matter. Uh, that's another story. Uh, then I, I told this to the prime minister that this is one method. And then uh, I, I've written to the enforcement directorate also. They have been stopped from going for, uh, forward. Then you have uh, the American method, which is a very fancy method, uh, which I like because <laughs> it's a macho method. <laughs> they found that the intelligence report that there are some 5,726 uh, bank accounts in Credit Suisse and uh, in uh, uh, Bank of uh, Union Bank of Switzerland. And so they have branches in, uh, in uh, Washington. So they sent their treasury agents to tell the uh, chairman of that uh, branch that please give us all the names and their accounts. They, the, these two chairmen said, no, we can't do that. We have a secrecy clause, blah, blah, etc." And so the treasury agents went back. Evening, the FBI came, picked up these guys, uh, these chairman, the, you know, all the other main officials, put them in jail <laughs> along with criminals. Within two days, days, Switzerland said, we'll give you all the names. names. Also, all the names can be. Now, the Credit Suisse and Union Bank also has branch office in Bombay. We can do the same thing. Same thing. This is one method. Then the other method is the German method, which the French also have used, which is uh, the Germans found that their uh, officials are having accounts in the neighboring country of Liechtenstein. So they asked the, uh, the uh, Merkel, the chancellor, asked the king, please give us the names, uh, please give us the details. So he said, no, this is our business, we'll be finished, that happened. So Merkel told uh, the German uh, officials, find the senior most banking official of Bank of uh, Liechtenstein, bribe him and get these names. 
So they, uh, these fellows met the senior most official, uh, bank official, and uh, 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 started offering him a bribe. And finally, they settled half a billion dollars, okay. uh, plus a U.S. citizenship, plus plastic surgery to change his face. <laughs> uh, it actually happened. Yeah. And they got the entire uh, uh, thing on a CD in which they found Indian accounts also. <laughs> and then we came the Indian accounts, the uh, Manmohan Singh government was refusing to uh, take, uh, accept the invitation of Merkel. Okay. So there's another way. Uh, the French did it also with the Union Bank, Hong Kong Shanghai Bank uh, in Geneva. So there are methods, methods of doing it. But the other countries must know you're serious. Serious about Now, it. we have today, uh, I have very serious doubts. Uh, um, about many of our officials in our government who they also have accounts abroad. Now they are not going to allow it to uh, uh, you to succeed on that. So we need uh, clarity. So when I explained all these methods to the Prime Minister, he preferred that United Nations method. So I sent him in uh, writing, but it's mm -hmm. still not still being implemented. Not. Swamiji, <coughs> other, other question like you know, you have tremendous uh, domain expertise on black money yeah. and how. So, slightly shifting the focus, mm, uh, uh, see you've written, studied uh, extensively about the Chinese yeah, model, sure. you know. Sure. I mean, some people even sure. accuse you of being little soft on China. I am soft on China. <laughs> I mean, I'm also a xenophile, let I'm me admit. A, no, 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 I'm not a xenophile. <laughs> I no, think, I mean in the sense that… I think our priority is to, to be yeah, friends so with So, you think like, you know, since, uh, to be very… If you really look at the uh, Chinese uh, leverage the manufacturing model to you know provide millions of jobs. Not correct. Not exactly correct. Okay. Not now that India India has kind of missed the manufacturing. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, bus. Is that, that part. I agree. So you know, is that there like uh, any lessons that we can learn from the sure, uh, Chinese sure. economic <coughs> miracle? Obviously, the political system. Uh, the realities are very different, yeah, you know, yeah. they don't have elections to face no, yeah, and Chinese all that. Chinese is not a manufacturing miracle. miracle. So, what do you think, uh, like I'll two, you three lessons you. that we can learn from them? In terms there are no lessons to learn from them. In fact, there are, uh, there are lessons to unlearn from them. <laughs> uh, but I'll tell you what the Chinese great success is due to, the Chinese model. They import semi-processed goods from Korea, Taiwan, Japan, um, Hong, you know, not Hong Kong, Singapore, Philippines, like that. And then they add value to it. Like for example, Lenovo. Lenovo comes in uh, in the circuit form from Taiwan. Absolutely. Then they put a, uh, a t keyboard on it, That's the right. glass case. No, no, they add value. It's value. not a circuit. Value it comes in, the, the basic circuits uh, come uh, from Taiwan. And then they put a stamp made in China. Okay. And what is the advantage for uh, Taiwan to do it? Because if it, Taiwan itself did it, the cost will become much higher. So they won't be able to sell it. So they sell it, give it to China. China has cheap labor, skilled labor, and then it imports, exports to America and Europe. So therefore, what happens is that uh, the Chinese have a deficit trade with East Asia because they're only importing from East Asia. But they have a huge surplus with uh, trade with uh, Europe and America. And so the sum total, they get a surplus and that is their model. There is no indigenous manufacturing capability of China Chinese. as of yet. But now the Chinese have realized that because the wages of their labor Labors is going up, up, therefore, uh, it, you know, they may not get an advantage. Some other countries might come in the picture. And therefore, now they are trying to what they call as rebalance their economy. India's lessons to learn, if you want a lesson to learn, it is this, that the Chinese can do it, we can do it better, better. because we have a lower, lower uh, skilled labor better. cost. So, but what is the problem? All these countries say, we like to come to India, you've got a court, you've got a, this thing, you've got patent laws, but you have a lousy infrastructure, infrastructure. and a corrupt system. Uh, uh, permission in Delhi, permission in the state, permission in the municipality. Uh, it's still, Delhi may be easy, but the, on the road it's ter terrible. The roads are all, you know, potholes, so on. It takes, a, what, one week to turn around a ship in, uh, in India. Absolutely. Uh, whereas in Singapore it takes a few hours. Absolutely. Okay. 
So these are the places now. The day we do that, we have an efficient uh, transportation system or uh, uh, highways, uh, uh, you know, national highway system. These people will all come to us, and we will get the boom. And we have already have a manufacturing base, but we have starved them with these high interest rates. You see, and we have literally driven out those labor intensive, uh, small and medium industries. Thanks to that uh, that crackpot called Raghuram Rajan, who uh, you know told me uh, told us all that if you raise interest rates, the inflation will be controlled. Of course, that's one way of doing it. But what's the consequence? consequence. A doctor can bring down a temperature by killing the patient. It's the fastest <laughs> way to bring down the temperature. But then that's it. You see, so because he's not an economist, uh, Raghuram Rajan, uh, just a management type, they know only these what is called as microeconomics. But macroeconomics is a general equilibrium okay. system. What you do here has an effect there, you see. So therefore, our mistake was that. Our first mistake was to have the Soviet model. Absolutely. And the second mistake is uh, to keep these interest rates so high that manufacturing decided to go for capital uh, and these labor, uh, labor laws, these socialist labor laws. So they went in for capital intensive technology. Absolutely. <coughs> Swamiji, the other question that I uh, wanted to ask you is that, you know, at 26 you had completed your PhD. 24. From 24, sorry. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, sorry, uh, huh. bad research <laughs> from no, me. No, problem. Uh, so no problem. Uh, you see, what happened is at 25 the convocation took place. Took place, okay. <coughs> but the PhD and I started teaching at 24. 24. They say uh, 90, uh, 1965. Uh, that is the official. That's a convocation. Okay. So uh, you but know the from thesis the was submitted in in '64, so in, uh, early '64. After working with uh, you know like very formidable yeah, economic yeah, scholars and Samuelson and, Samuel Samuel and, and others, and, uh, so you and decided Sarkoz, to Kuznets, yeah. you decided to take a. I think initially you came to teach in DSC uh, uh, well, or IIT. I first Delhi. started teaching at Harvard, Harvard, and then I became associate professor. I was due for becoming a full professor, so the choice was whether should I settle down permanently or go back, and I wanted to go back. So at that time, uh, Delhi School invited me mm. to teach. So I went for one summer. I taught, I liked it. So I told them I'll come back, come back. Wow. and uh, accept the chair for China. But by the time I came, Congress split. Communist uh, Indira Gandhi had to depend on communists. Mr. Uh, Amartya Sen uh, immediately turned color Col because he's an uh, opportunist of the first order. <laughs> and uh, after inviting me to be a professor, he coolly buzzed off. And so I went and became professor at IIT. I taught there for three years as a full professor. Suddenly, Mrs. Gandhi picked up my book, which I had written on alternative economic mm -hmm. planning, and read out and said, this dangerous man coming from America, polluting the minds. <laughs> How is he a professor? <laughs> Next day, I was sacked. And I fought in court, and 22 years later, I won. But I was a minister by then. <laughs> so I went and joined for one year, and uh, then resigned the next day. Okay. So, uh, what was that moment where you decided to, you know, take a plunge into politics? Is there like some individual who inspired you? Or no, is it no, your no, no, no. I couldn't get any other job in <laughs> India. I'm serious. I applied to Dibrugod University. Uh, they couldn't take anybody else because my first, qualification. First preference was still professor. I was a yeah. I was intending. I never intended to go to politics. Uh, I was a mathematical economist. Yeah. I was already famous in China. On China, I had a joint paper with Paul Samuelson. On index numbers became classic in the field. Field. Uh, in fact, the more Samuelson, uh, you know, article said I have five students who will get Nobel Prize in the next yeah, ten years, right. and four <laughs> got it. I'm the only one who didn't get it because I came away. Yeah. Uh, but I thought, why should I go back? I mean, it's a big deal. I may become Nobel laureate. What is this whole thing? Now do you Clean regret up the decisions? Huh? Now you regret it? Me? Yeah. Why should I? <laughs> no. What is it? <laughs> All my peers are now retired and watching television. Whereas <laughs> I, I'm uh, ruling, uh, ruling the roost here. Absolutely, sir. Absolutely. I think it is uh, India's gain, I would say, I mean, mm. that you had uh, come back. Yeah. Uh, so the other question that I wanted to ask is that since uh, Swarajya magazine, uh, in a way, is very close to your ideology in terms yeah. of, you know, free market, I mean, yeah. it basically this magazine was started as a dissent against the Nehruvian socialism and At Rajaji, Rajaji yeah, coined right. it yeah. infamous license quota permit, that's yeah, right. And Rajaji was also a very unapologetic uh, yeah, yeah, civilizational yeah. guy, you know, yeah. he was a scholar yeah, of, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. so, bit like you, 
you know blending free market economics with uh, uh, the cultural civilizational yes, yes, that's right, that's uh, right. ethos so do you think that you know uh, uh, from the economic side your ideas are very clear do you think there is a solid ground to find uh, you know marry a kind of free market uh, thinking with uh, hindu civilizational ethos you think there is a natural uh, you know convergence yeah, yeah, yeah. or uh, yeah see the hindu philosophy we don't have a prophet absolutely so there is no one to command us <laughs> okay uh, you want to believe in god you can you want to believe only in shiva but not in vishnu you can you can want to believe in vishnu but not in shiva you can you if you can say don't believe in any murtis at all absolutely. like arya samaj ji you can can you say i don't believe in god if you are fa- if you are sincerely don't believe in god still you are a hindu you are called a gnostic so the most decentralized religion absolutely is hinduism natural for market market uh, the brilliant the only addition that uh, uh, hinduism brings which makes us a more happy people than the americans is we do not uh, believe in materialism a one dimensional materialism absolutely we believe spiritual values are important, important. so we venerate people who sacrifice but are knowledgeable you see gandhi used to go around half naked with a piece of cloth around him can you imagine in america a politician going in his underwear <laughs> they will put him in jail immediately you see and they for long years people don't understand how can you walk behind this lean uh, skeleton called gandhi uh, who is half naked and uh, churchill used to call him half naked that see our uh, spiritual leaders also simple uh, simply clothed look at pope Uh, how the way he, he looks like a jewelry so- store on the move you see uh, or the imam in uh, in makka so this veneration of knowledge what we call as gyan and tyag you see that is what separates us from the western world of market economy Beautiful. market economy is driven by profit but we do not consider we don't tab- hold it as taboo but we think the higher thing in society and which all need not do but some uh, must do which pursue knowledge and give up the normal pleasures of life and he would be higher than the king in fact the king will have to go and seek his advice absolutely policy decisions were made by knowledgeable people absolutely and only the fighting defending was done by the king king and those of who made money well if they beyond their legitimate needs if they gave it to society then they were also very really highly so the it. other question uh, swami ji that i wanted to ask you is that you know basically uh, the us elections just happened but uh, i mean the us election has been a culmination of certain economic and political trends across the world like for example you are probably one of the best persons to respond having tremendous knowledge on free trade I mean on global trade there is a feeling that protectionism across the world is returning i mean returning with a big bang like even you know all the early noises uh, by trump lot of people dismissed probably as election rhetoric but you know his appointments the subsequent uh, the way in which he's conducted himself also looks that protectionism might come back very strongly <laughs> in the us or i mean some form of uh, protectionism you know more like uh, i mean you know like basically the yeah yeah i understand uh, so w- how do you think you know it's going to uh, even it's already india is feeling like you know our exports uh, are not as good as what it used to be and you know even china has kind of hit the uh, so as to speak the wall so how do you see this protectionism playing out is it a transient phenomenon or you think you know since there is a underlying no, political a, force see, the wto is still there still there yeah and uh, you can always fight uh, unjustified tariffs in the wto and the the fight is going on every day uh, we are putting cases against china and china is putting cases in america america is putting cases on india uh, on drug uh, drugs for example, example. Uh, 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 the pharmaceutical industry the americans are putting all kinds of cases against us in that uh, i don't think so i don't think also trump has got anything to do with protectionism trump was was the first person to recognize i think that this political correctness is hypocrisy hypocrisy and the public hated it and most public was not going to vote 
American uh, voting percentages were 40, 41, much, much lower than India's. Around so, 50. Uh, now it is time. This time. Uh, but uh, you see the last election. And uh, therefore, uh, or the earlier elections, you take the average, it's around 40, 42. And uh, now, when he began speaking their language in their crude way, <laughs> maybe all the sophisticates were are not happy. But the these masses, Middle America, so they decided to go and vote, and they were not, they didn't participate in any polling because nobody went to their houses, uh, <laughs> uh, and so yeah. they got the polls wrong, uh, and uh, Trump won, and I supported Trump uh, okay. winning. I in fact won a bet with the Prime Minister's principal secretary who said the whole country thinks that uh, Hillary is going to win and you are the only one who says that. I said, take a bet. <laughs> and I won the bet. Uh, and the New York Times carried a big story about how Trump had an avid supporter uh, in a Hindu fanatic uh, in India. So, um, the, uh, same thing with Brexit. This, the, the lumpen masses, as you call them, they are fed up. All this, uh, they want their country back. They said, we don't want all this internationalism. It's got nothing with protectionism that way. And uh, now Italy, I mean, the guy who won, there was behind four, five points behind uh, in the polls. Absolutely. So, what about Modi? I mean, who ever thought he's going to... Uh, 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 of course, Modi's victory has got to do with A, his personality, but two, our anti-corruption fight, Absolutely. which I'm well, responsible for. Right, right. And the third was Hindutva, which RSS was responsible for. It's a convergence Because of for years we were dividing the Hindu vote and uniting the minority vote. And we said we won't allow the Hindu vote to be divided to the extent that we can. And our percentage votes went up from 21 to 31, we got majority. Right, so right. regarding the Hindu causes that you talk about, a lot of what was uh, based on that Hindutva sentiment was there. Yeah. But after coming to power as it happens, every uh, cool. whenever the BJP government comes in, they abandon the Hindu causes. Right now we have Right to Education Act that is very sectarian to Hindu uh, population. We have temples that are under government control. So why BJP doesn't act on these uh, things that are very much secular actually, that are discriminatory against Hindu population? But so we are doing it on uh, triple talaq, we are doing it on India Uniform Civil Court. You no, want us to do all everything <laughs> together? The, you, the, the real... Uh, Ram Temple I am doing. <laughs> So, <laughs> education is like most basic And temples, by the way, I got yeah. the Savanaga temple released. Absolutely. And now I got a uh, no, petition sir. Supreme Court to scrap the Hindu... No, the, Hindu the concern uh, is, you know, there is Swami, uh, Dr. Swami, who is like the uh, kind of one-man army fighting for the causes dear to yeah. Hindus, but ideally, uh, you no, know, no, there no, should be like at least I, some I, I, hundred I, I, clones of uh, Dr. Swami is the institutional no. perspective. No, no, I agree. But, uh, you see, uh, I think the change around that has taken place uh, in the last uh, th two and a half years is something that had not happened in the last 70 years. Absolutely. Okay. And uh, we still got two and a half years. So, we c you can raise this question. I agree, Mr. Vajpayee did not and that's why he lost. I have told Narendra Modi also, don't think that development gives you victory. Development, uh, development is a necessary condition for your victory. Absolutely. But it's not sufficient. Uh, Narsimha Rao produced the best economic development in five years. And he, my God, he was thrashed. His party strength came down to half. half. Uh, so did Rajiv Gandhi, who produced the best industrial development growth rate. Mr. Moraji Desai produced the best uh, uh, price, uh, price uh, uh, you know, the decline. decline. Uh, and uh, all three lost. So uh, Chandrababu Naidu lost. Krishna lost, so nobody can win on development alone, provided you don't have negative development. Absolutely. I mean, then of course, uh, so it's a necessary condition, yes, not, not sufficient. a sufficient condition. For sufficient, you have to bring some sentiment. Sentiment is maybe fight with Pakistan, that's a sentiment, or Hindutva, we Hindus have been, you know, we are majority, we are 80 percent, but we are treated like we are 5 percent. You know, th that kind of sentiment is now important. So, so uh, the best can be said is you are not anti-Hindu party uh, currently. No, no, party may be anything, <laughs> but uh, no, it's too early to judge. Uh, too it's early too to early judge. to judge. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, 
I mean, till yesterday, uh, till two year, two months ago, no, no, uh, our, none of our people are talking about uniform civil court. None of them are talking about triple talaq. We are now talking about absolutely, it. absolutely. Sir, Doctor, uh, uh, yeah. follow-up question yeah. on that: uh, triple talaq or uniform civil court does not uh, directly impact the Hindu population. It is a good cause. It's a demand for Hindu of Hindus. It is demand of Hindus, but it's like a, it's not directly impacting yeah, I mean, us. Yeah, you you want us to do a, what, what, go straight to disenfranchising and <laughs> enfranchising <laughs> Muslims? That, that is not the. Ah, all right. So I am saying that these are the Hindu agenda that we put in our before the public the ram temple uh, uniform civil court article 370 uh, article 370 by the way mark my words will before 2019 will go all right uh, it will go uh, ram temple will be built next year i'm telling you i'll win the case in supreme court uh, uh, ban on cow slaughter we have strengthened it we have removed all subsidies to beef exports so a lot of things we have done but I don't know uh, uh, what will may convince you. <laughs> uh, what I wanted to say is the uh -huh. Right to Education Act, as you must know. Yeah, I know. There is a clause in that that uh, only Hindu uh, Run institutions are, you know, impacted on that. So I know that. So how that, uh, that, uh, th th what that will there are a lot of foolish things we have done <laughs> uh, with our application of mind. But that doesn't mean we can't fix it. Fix it. We have, uh, uh, right now I'm fighting uh, GST on the ground that this GSTN is anti-national. And I'll win. Similarly, on, uh, on the Prevention of Corruption Act, uh, we, uh, we moved a bill to delete the clause by which I got the 2G spectrum scam uh, <laughs> uh, validated. And uh, if, if that amendment which has been moved uh, is passed in Parliament, then Augusta, all will be let free, <laughs> I'm telling you. Okay. Because the most important clause in the in the uh, Prevention of Corruption Act is uh, Section 13, bracket 1, bracket uh, D, part 3, Regarding which, uh, which, which says that if I'm a minister and I enable somebody else to make a profit, which is not in the public interest, then even though I've got no money, I'm still, still guilty under Prevention of Corruption. So that, uh, Dr. Swami, probably a couple of more questions because I know yeah. you must be having a <laughs> have have dinner. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but you know we can't have enough of you so you know. <laughs> <laughs> so the the question that I wanted to ask brings to your favorite state yes. uh, where I also come from Tamil Nadu yes. where at least Not uh, state, <laughs> my, mother. This is my motherland where you know the kind of uh, at least one chief minister you brought down uh, and you know yeah. and Probably everybody in every politician in Tamil Nadu, I mean, yeah. even, even in India too, but more so in Tamil Nadu, yeah. has a lot of uh, fear yes, about the kind right. of work that that's you have right. done. So now that you know, uh, Jayalalitha, yeah. uh, Selvi Jayalalitha passed away, yeah. uh, how do you see the political situation <laughs> unraveling there? Is that like yeah. anybody's, uh, how yeah. is it? Uh, what's your, uh, give us something which I, probably I, is I, not I'll, in the public. I'll tell you <laughs> one scenario which is possible. Possible. But they are, uh, they are obstruction for my getting it implemented. And that is, from today, BJP decides we'll go alone. And uh, it s decides to set up candidates in every constituency in the state. That is 234 in the assembly and 39 in, in parliament. We will have no alliance with anybody before elections. And announce it now and start shortlisting candidates from today. Uh, the next uh, parliament election is 2019, two and a half years from now, and uh, 216 was the last assembly two election. 221. 221. So we've got plenty of time. And we have an organization. And the younger generation is national minded. Absolutely. I have met Tamilians after Tamilians that we made a big mistake in not being taught Hindi. We can't move around the way other state people are able to move around. So they, they want to be part of the India. I'm not saying that we should ignore our Tamil identity, but Tamil identity is subservient to the national identity. Uh, Tamil interest is subservient to national interest. If something clashes, if tam some Tamil interest, like supporting LTT, um, uh, clashes with our national interest against terrorism, that will prevail, not their uh, bloody no, but LTT. Sw Swamiji, there has always been a a very, I mean, maybe the fringe is probably noticed, but you know, if you took a look at a median Tamilian, yeah. 
he is comfortable both with the tamil exceptionalism as well as the mainstream national narrative it's like you know a very yeah. uh, uh, but you know, have to choose when no there is no they are comfortable with both and i mean like you know party no, like no, admk no, uh, kind no, of no 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 party of admk uh, uh, after mrs uh, miss jailita was threatened by the us consul general's office uh, consulate general's office she went all totally on the side of christians and muslims you see uh she was only pra- individually practicing hindu otherwise all her policies were anti hindu the question today and so many uh, rss people have been killed in Kill. uh, in tamil nadu and nothing has been done about it and the isis has reared his ugly head in tamil nadu Tamil-Nadu. so i think the people are afraid and therefore we have to tell them that you you uh, you uh, bond with us and we will see because we got power in the center we can uh, like i did with uh, karna nidhi in 1991 i dismissed his government mm. they told me rivers of blood will flow tamil nadu will become a separate state all these my officers told us uh, in the cabinet meeting and chandrashekar said will you take responsibility i said of course i went there and sat there and when we dis- uh, dismissed the dmk DM- DM- government nothing happened they told me buses will be burnt not even a cycle was burnt then i had to hunt for where is karna nidhi gone <laughs> i found that he had taken his three wives and hidden oliver road you see so uh, all this when Red you trip. decide to use the power of the center these guys can't do anything because they're all foreign inspired either by ltt or by some uh, jihadi organizations and so on and we have to tell the people give them the confidence we'll stand with you uh, but take a national stand learn hindi um, uh, identify with your, your Yeah, with the national interests take interest in all these issues and they do the young tamils are telling me why don't you come back to tamil nadu i said no i can't come back unless the, i give so i, the, I give brings, it. i want to ask you sorry uh, 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 there are some wild uh, speculations that I'm you might down, be the uh, next uh, governor of no, tamil no. nadu no, no, i think I have, <laughs> i have turned down the governorship of maharashtra i have turned down the governorship of uh, of uh, up now i have turned down also these are all informal soundings i had also turned down the vice chancellorship of jawaharlal yeah. university and the presidentship of the brics bank in yeah, china that that uh, i told them it will never come because the chinese have told me that don't touch it we did not would come and now it has been proved right yeah, there is no a brics bank but the name <laughs> so i will tell you one thing i am not going to take any of the ceremonial posts where all you do is is sit and have breakfast Sorry, lunch no but governor of tamil nadu will be nah, interesting nah, assignment nah, some you, you <laughs> give me bjp hand it over to me and say run it like you like i will t- transform bjp tomorrow but the present one is all vested interests yeah yeah okay uh, that uh, i think uh, we should conclude here because sir it's been a really really fascinating discussion and i'm hoping to meet you more sure. often to sure. on your sure. economic ideas especially you sure. know i think i think sir i really see that some of your ideas that you propounded 20 years back yeah, yeah. getting a fresh lease of life yeah yeah uh, i think right. now i predicted in july that uh, crude oil prices rise in uh, in in, uh, in uh, december it started happening absolutely yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So okay. wonderful talking to you Sonic ji and you got